All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started here. I just fired the recording on Zoom real quick, so that's live. Questions for me before we get started here? Same, uh, same schedule we discussed last time. We've covered all the material we need to for test three. It's going to be just chapters um, eight, nine, I'm sorry, chapters nine, 10, and 11. So we've covered those. Uh, we can review those today. Just kind of quickly, I grabbed some highlights from the last three or four lectures to try to put them together as we can look at tonight. Uh, we're going to go pretty quick. And, and again, kind of like with previous reviews, our goal here is not necessarily, um, our goal here is, is to help you kind of figure out, oh, hey, if we talk about something and that doesn't ring much of a bell, that, that make a note. That's what you need to go back and review, okay? Uh, as we've discussed before, the, the summaries, the end of the chapter summaries, those are really good study places. Um, some of the questions in there get uh, a lot more specific on some, some technical information than I like to on the exam question, but if you, uh, if you do well on those questions, the review questions at the end of the chapters, you're going to do really well, most likely on the exams, okay? All right, like I said, questions here before we get rolling. Awesome. Okay. Uh, we'll meet here for, uh, obviously we're here tonight, we'll meet here on Wednesday, also we'll meet here, and then we'll move out to the STEM building to do labs, like normal. Uh, on Wednesday, we will start chapter 12. That'll be material that'll be on test four. Um, but that gives you guys kind of that weekend, then over the night, to, to study for the test three. We'll do test three a week from today on Monday, April 12th. On that day, to take the test, we'll just move up to the computer lab. I'll we'll verify that it's available, but that should be, a, um, it's pretty straightforward to host that on Canvas. And uh, I'm just have you guys take it there. Okay. All right. That's what we're looking at. Uh, and again, just for reference, last day of withdrawal, middle of April. It's, it's uh, about two or three weeks from today. So that's approaching. It's not trying to say, hey, get out of my class. I'm not saying anything like that. It's just letting you know any, any 16 week course you're taking here at this college, April 19th is our last day of withdrawal. Okay. Hey, again, Kind of quickly, a high point for the last three chapters. Uh, chapter nine, our focus there is communication between cells. Cells need to be able to communicate with each other in a multicellular organism. It's really important that cells know what each other's doing, know what each other is deficient of, know which, what each other has a surplus of, um, are they under attack, things of that nature. They need to be able to communicate with each other and let each other know a little bit about what's going on in their situation. They don't have eyes and ears. How do they communicate? They communicate with molecules called ligands. So you've got your signaling cell or secreting cell or putting out the ligands out into this interest, interest, extracellular space, the intercellular space, the space between the cells. Um, those ligands will then find cells that have receptors for that particular molecule. Those are targets. Those targets have some sort of receptor, some sort of receptor molecule that's typically designed for whatever the specific ligand that's being emitted is kind of going to have a receptor for that type of ligand. So there's different categories of ligands, different categories that this signal can come in. So autocrine is when the cell is communicating with itself, it's sending a signal to itself, maybe other parts of its own cell, or putting them out so they can come back in, whatever the case may be. Now, one type of communication between two cells that are very close to each other is called the gap connection or gap junction. So a gap junction, of course, is the structure that anchors or ties two cells together. We see this a lot of times in plant cells. Those gaps allow nice little channels that they can move water and or other nutrients through very quickly from one cell to the next. They can also send signals through those channels, okay, those gaps. 
paracrine, so autocrine, auto meaning self, that's the first category is autocrine. Uh, paracrine, so crin referring to this communication within the body, paracrine means those are two cells that are very close to one another and sending signals within a very close proximity to each other. These signals have got to be degraded pretty quickly. It needs to be a pretty fast signal. Um, again, we need to degrade the signal. Whatever's in that space needs to be cleared out pretty rapidly because those signals may need to be repeated multiple times. And you've got what we call the endocrine system. Sometimes it's uh, hormones is kind of a nice way to think about that, where one part of the body Something's occurred at one part of the body and it needs to tell some other part of the body that it needs um, a particular protein or uh, a particular, uh, whatever the case may be, some other chemical compound for function. Right? So um, the endocrine is where we send ligands into the bloodstream. We deliver it throughout the body so it will be received by whatever the particular target of that ligand may be. So if um, muscles are getting, uh, <clears throat> muscles are running out of oxygen, we'll say, then they'll, they'll start sending out signals, put it in the bloodstream, and that tells the heart and the respiratory system to increase their intake, and that way we can get enough oxygen into the cells that need it, for example. Uh, your text talks about the adrenaline, and, and just one more there on, on endocrine, your text talks about adrenaline where it basically when adrenaline's sent out, that tells your body be ready for what we call the fight or flight response. Um, it tends to slow down your ability to think rationally uh, and it, it speeds up the heart rate and gets your cells to generate lots of energy very quickly. I always tell my students it's really good if you're fighting a saber-toothed cat, not so good if you're taking a test. Find some way to kind of Give your body a chance to flush some of that, that, um, that adrenaline from your system when you get uh, that fight or flight response. Sometimes you need to be able to think logically and critically. All right. So again, various types of signals: autocrine, paracrine, endocrine, and then gap junction. There are various ways that those signals can be sent, and there's various ways those signals can be received. Two main categories of these receptors, the way that the signals will be received, there's receptors on the surface of the cell. All these cell surface receptors, they are anchored into the plasma membrane somehow. <clears throat> if we've got a cell surface receptor, the ligand does not necessarily have to cross into the cell. Um, in order to deliver its message. It can just simply interact the, the exterior portion of the cell surface receptor and achieve its purpose, message sent, message received. Uh, a lot of times these ligands for cell surface receptors, a lot of times the ligands actually can't get to the plasma membrane. They may be polar in nature, so the membrane is, is permeable to them. They're not permeable, uh, not permeable to them. Uh, it could be large protein structures where um, you know, they're just too large to try to fit through the membrane. And whatever the case may be, most of the time a cell surface receptor, the ligands it receives, are not going to actually make it through the plasma membrane. As opposed to intracellular receptors, those are receptors that are inside the cell. That does require that those ligands must be uh, selected through the selectively permeable membrane. They, those ligands must be able to make their way through the plasma membrane into the cell to actually be received. Somehow they've got to be able to filter through that filter. A uh, common example, we mentioned RNA transcription triggers. So some kind of, uh, again, some kind of hormone or some kind of ligand, something that can be transmitted um, externally, outside of the cell, make its way through the plasma membrane, Activate a receptor inside. A lot of times, this is a, an RNA transcriptase or something like that, where uh, it initiates the process of copying the DNA to an RNA molecule. 
Because again, the DNA, unless the cell is going through mitosis or meiosis, we'll talk about it in a little bit, the DNA stays in the nucleus, at least of eukaryotic organisms. The DNA is, um, if you know much about computers, think about the DNA as kind of like the hard drive. You might store stuff on the hard drive, and it doesn't normally come out unless you have to do something to get it out. Okay? So if I want to print something that's on my hard drive, I'm going to have to activate whatever some program to carry that information out of the hard drive so I can print it. Same thing here. Um, the DNA does not leave that nucleus. That DNA stays in the nucleus. Um, and then uh, unless something causes it to come out. But we need a copy of the information to come into the cytoplasm so the ribosomes can attach and start building protein. So again, common intracellular receptors are things that will go ahead and trigger that process of transcripting DNA to RNA so the ribosomes can go to work on. And again, just kind of going quickly here, talking about some high points or something, just make notes of the things that, hey, Steve, I'm, I'm not 100% clear on that. I don't remember that 100%. It's been weeks ago. Make notes of that kind of stuff. I get, that gives you an idea of what, what type of things you'll want to review. Okay. All right, so cell surface receptors. Again, intracellular, inside the cell, ligands have to pass through the membrane. Extracellular receptors are the other kinds. Those ligands do not have to pass through the membrane to activate these receptors. Uh, in fact, most of those ligands do not. But these receptors have to have three components. There has to be the external component that actually receives the ligand. There has to be a component that basically attaches to the, the plasma membrane. We call this the trans uh, membrane portion or transmembrane domain. If you get your extracellular domain, I think we drew arrows these last time, right? You got your extracellular domain is this guy. You got your transmembrane, that is the portion that is implanted into the membrane here. It's your transmembrane. And then the intracellular, of course, is just whatever is inside the cell that interacts with the com components, compounds inside the cell. Um, the common thing that's going to happen is the ligand's going to hit the extracellular receptor. That sends a signal to the transmembrane domain. And then the intracellular domain then um, will, will do, go through a process we call phospho, phosphorylation, where it's actually going to um, add phosphorus or, uh, to particular compounds, changing their energy, changing their shape, increasing their energy, and basically activating. All right, so what happens from there? Once, that's, once that uh, ligand activates, um, the receptor. Well, a number of things can happen. There's, there's too many to try to, to draw. We can point to some major categories. That's what we'll do here is kind of point out some major categories, some, some common things that will happen. All of those things that happen, we, we call this signaling pathway or the signaling cascade. That refers to this chain of events that occurs once the receptor is activated. Something binds the ligand. Uh, again, there's these, because especially with extracellular uh, receptors, that ligand doesn't make its way into the cell. It just activates something on the surface of the cell. So how does this thing out on the plasma membrane, how does it communicate with the rest of the contents of the cell? That's what we call secondary messengers. These are smaller molecules a lot of times that once the uh, once the intracellular domain, if we back up here, once, once this guy is, is actually activated because it's received the signal down from the ligand, it this actually activates and does whatever this particular one is designed to do, a lot of times then they will begin triggering secondary messenger molecules to propagate throughout the cell. And those secondary messengers will make sure whatever, whatever signal is sent in gets carried out throughout the, the cytoplasm. So that's a big chunk of the signal in the cascade.
right? Yeah, just review tonight. <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> what happens after that's, again, after we've initiated the uh, signaling cascade, where do we go from there? Well, too many to count. The common things that will happen is um, production of a specific protein. Again, we talked about generating RNA, a copy of mRNA from a DNA molecule, and that's going to then begin some sort of protein to be produced. Um, we talked about uh, you know in, uh, the endocrine system. When we send adrenaline out, that tells all the cells to begin increasing their metabolism, be ready with a lot of stored energy. Um, something's about to go down. That's right. Where that's fight or flight mechanisms kicking in. Let's not think. Let's be ready to act. So just one example of what happens when when the signal is sent out. Well, it, it depends on what the signal is, and it depends on what the the body's reaction is going to be to. Um, we've talked, you know, and then we've, now that we've talked about chapters 10 and 11, let me just kind of mention all this, that's how cells know that they need, to, a lot of times that's how some cells will know that they need to begin reproducing, they need to begin dividing. They're receiving a signal from other cells around them, or maybe they're not receiving a signal from other cells around them, right? Uh, if, if, if a cell is not receiving cells, signals from cells around it, that may mean, hey, there's a gap, we need more cells to fill the gap. They begin reproducing, or some lack of some signals will tell a cell, hey, I've gone somewhere, I've broken free, and I've gone somewhere I'm not supposed to be, right? In, in the case of, of like tissue cells, um, if part of a tissue gets swept into the bloodstream to other parts of uh, other organs or other parts of the body, that cell is no longer receiving signals from the other kidney cells, whatever it happens to be. And that will sometimes trigger apoptosis, when the cell will basically self-destruct. It's no longer needed wherever it happens to be for whatever reason. All right. Who's been reading your book? What's this? Tell me what's happening here. I didn't mention this in the lecture. But it's kind of important. We ran out of time. What is this? You guys are not reading your books. <laughs> it's yes, it's a synapsis. That's okay. That's okay. This is, this is a synapsis. This is the gap between the two cells. So I've got two neuro, um, two neuron cells essentially. Right? You've got two cells. One is sending a signal to the other. Okay. So what happens is in, in nerve cells. They will, and the signal gets sent fast, very, very quickly, because it needs to be repeatable. Um, so the signal gets sent very quickly. The neurotrans, what we call the neurotransmitter, that is the ligand that gets sent from one cell across a synapsis to the other. <clears throat> and then you've got these enzymes floating around, clearing the space out that signal needs to be possibly repeated again very quickly. The neurotransmitters that, uh, that don't get bound to the, the other side of the synapse, um, they've got to be cleaned out. And then what happens is when those when these neurotransmitter ligands do uh, connect to the receptor, what that does is that, change, that creates basically an electrical charge that gets transmitted throughout that receiving cell and that charge hits and releases neurotransmitters at the other end of that cell. So you have a chain of these cells sending one signal right out to the other rapidly. Uh, your text gives the example of when you, when you touch a hot surface, your brain needs to know that information very, very quickly. That information from those, those nerve, those sensors on your finger, whatever's touching that hot surface, they need to tell your brain very quickly Fire the muscles, pull those things back. We're going to lose finger pocket. Okay. So it has to happen very quickly. What do you think? It's autocrine, paracrine, endocrine. What are we looking at here? Paracrine. Paracrine. You have cells right next to each other, communicating very rapid information. That it, and because they're so close and we need to maintain a gradient so that signal can be transmitted very quickly, 
we've got to clear that signal out as opposed to endocrine where we can just kind of flood the system with the signal, make sure it gets to the right place. The paracrine has to happen quickly. It has to be cleared so it's ready to reset. Autocrine again is, is communication within the same cell. All right, we mentioned just a little bit here, just a couple of terms about uh, communication between bacteria, the, your ligands essentially, your, your uh, are the, we call them autoinducers. That's, uh, those are ligands essentially that have been sent from one bacteria to another to communicate about uh, presence, availability, resources, conditions. There's a term we've used in biology for quite some time called quorum sensing, and that refers to a quorum, a group of individual bacteria when they need to be able to communicate with each other so they don't utilize all of their own resources and starve each other out, things of that nature. So again, just some terms there, be familiar with them. We did mention the term biofilm. Just be aware of what a biofilm is. There's a lot of stuff. If we watch this video, there's a lot of really good stuff there. I'm not going to test you over the stuff in the video, just this, this term here. Just be aware of what a biofilm is. It's a fairly recent discovery uh, within biological sciences. Just need to be aware of that it's a thing. Okay. All right. I think that is most, yeah, that's most of the critical stuff in chapter nine. I'm sure I've missed a few things in there. Um, check the chapter summaries, check the homework, check the quizzes. Uh, these are all kind of nice places to start. Text, rewatch the videos if you need to. Again, we're just trying to hit some high points today. All right, so chapter 10, we talk about what we call the cell cycle, specifically working our way up to mitosis or reproducing clones or a, a, an exact replica of the existing cell. So as we've just seen, most of the time, there, there, there either has to be a signal or an absence of a signal telling the cell, hey, we need more of you, get to work. Um, that's what will have to happen. Now, for a cell to, to divide, for a cell to go through the entire cell cycle and reproduce, uh, it's got to copy everything. Copy everything. The DNA is, is what we'll kind of focus on in the process of, of making sure that each new cell gets the right DNA. That's, that's really what we'll focus on. But again, the organelles, all the components within the cell, those all have to be copied as well. But if the DNA is not there, there's not information on how to generate the proteins necessary to create those organelles. So that's the reason we'll focus on those. Okay. There's a little song here. I tried to sing it to my wife, and she was not impressed. So I'm not going to sing it to you guys. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it, the structure of how is DNA? We don't, we think about chromosomes, I think it's one of the next slides here. Right? We think about chromosomes as being DNA, and that is true, but we don't normally see DNA in this chromosome form with the exception of when we're, we're going through mitosis, when we're creating more cells. Um, most of the time, the DNA is kind of in this chromatin, somewhat condensed form. But again, we spent a lot of time, we talked about you know, in a human cell, there this is about a this is a meter, not about this is a meter, it's about a little more than three foot. There are two of these. If you stretch all the DNA in your cells out, there are two of these long of DNA, roughly. And that's huge. It's a massive amount, and we can't just leave that just floating freely in these cells that you can't even see with the naked eye. They can't just be free floating in there. We, we have to somehow organize those down to be able to manipulate them. Well, there are these proteins we call histones that help us build a structure upon which we can organize the DNA. So you have histones where you've got DNA wrapped around the histones that generates a nucleosome 
you get a chain of nucleosomes together and they form a nice kind of spindle of chromatin. And you continue to wrap that chromatin and pack it around some other proteins and that will eventually generate this structure we call the chromosome where all those all those DNA molecules are wound up as tight as we can, almost say as tight as we can get them, but incredibly tight. Okay? And again, we think about the chromosome as this unit of DNA. And it is, when, and especially whenever the cell is being divided. That's how your, your cells and all cells figure out that they have the exact same copies of DNA for each, for each individual new cell. They condense them down into chromosomes. So that is how your cell will ultimately organize the DNA. But again, just, just understand, you understand, it's not normally in chromosome form because it's, you, your cells need to be able to read the information stored in that DNA. And it can't get the enzymes in there to open the DNA up and copy RNA from it when it's all tightly bound up into a chromosome. Okay. Um, <clears throat> We have this thing we call homologous chromosomes. That's where you've got two chromosomes. There's a pair of them. Um, and basically, it's one from the father and one from the mother. Okay? So those two together forms a homologous pair of chromosomes. So each organism, each species has a particular number of pairs of homologous chromosomes. We said humans have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. <clears throat> So that's 23 pairs, that's 46 chromosomes that the human cell is going to have, 23 from the mother, 23 from the father. And in, in all 46 of those chromosomes have to be copied before a new cell can be produced. This occurs during, we'll look at the phases here in just a second, but this occurs during what we call S phase, where the individual chromosome gets copied. They keep the two copies together. Join them with this structure, this protein structure we call the centromere. The two copies joined together at the centromere gives this classic X shape that we see most chromosomes in. It happens to be a Y chromosome. We'll talk more about in chapter 12. And again, confusingly, <laughs> we call a single chromosome a chromosome. We call a joined pair of duplicated chromosomes. We call that X shape. We call that a chromosome. But the individual legs of that X we call chromatids when they're copied and joined together. And then once they get separated, once the cells are ready to completely separate, those separate into two different, now identical copy chromosomes of each other. Okay. So again, the cell cycle start with this what we call the interface. The interface has three major components. This is where most of the, sp the cell typically spends most of its time in this interphase portion of the cycle. Uh, interphase is broken up into three parts. The first gap, the G1, is where we're just making sure we have enough energy to actually proceed with the process of copying everything. So not only do we need um, enough energy to go through that process, we also need to make sure we have enough of the larger macromolecules we talked about earlier when we talked about you know, in, in um, the chemistry portion of the text. Those molecules are not cheap. They take energy to put together. We have to make sure we have enough of those molecules or enough energy to construct them as we go. So all the lipids, all the nucleotides, generate all the nucleic acid we need. It all requires energy. So we need a good energy source somewhere, good mechanism for breaking that energy source down as we spent the last exam talking about respiration. So once the cell is determined that it's got all the energy it needs and all the components it needs to copy everything, then it begins copying the chromosomes. So that's the S phase. The S phase is where all the chromosomes get duplicated. Again, that generates a pair of chromatids Copies of that exact same chromosome we join together with the centromere. We call those chromatids while they're joined. And once everything's been copied, stored enough energy, 
go to the G2 phase, the second gap, and make sure that we've got enough energy to go through the actual separation process. All the materials we need is just kind of another check and a period where we can continue to gather more energy. Uh, now we've expended all this energy copying DNA. A little more energy so we're ready to go for it. And that's interphase. Three, three steps in the interphase. G1, S phase, G2. <clears throat> Mitosis is the phase where the cell actually rearranges and prepares to be divided. We've got this third step we call cytokinesis where the cell physically actually separates. So mitosis where we get everything organized and move to opposite ends of the cell. Cytokinesis where the cell actually physically divides. The plasma membrane gets pinched to a point where it basically fuses into two smaller plasma membranes. You get three should be review. Something's something's not uh, you know if, if you're, you're clicking on only about fifty percent of what is cytokinesis, we'll make a note of that. Now we get a nice grasp on that uh, a little bit later. Okay. Now there is this G zero phase, the G not phase. Right. You ever heard not instead of zero? Uh, it's, it's a common, it's a fairly common science thing. I don't know it's common in biology, it's common in physics a lot of times. If you see G0, it says G0, you can say G0. So if I, if I if you catch me saying G0 phase, we're, we're not for zero, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, the G0 phase, that is where the cell is basically kind of, for whatever reason, it's received an, a specific signal or, or is lacking a specific signal to proceed working its way to mitosis. It's just happy to, to survive in its current state. Uh, the needs are being met. There's no need for more copies of this particular cell. It's just going to wait and try to do what it needs to do as long as it needs to. Okay. So it doesn't really fit nicely. If I back up, it doesn't really fit nicely into anywhere within the cell cycle because it's kind of its own thing. But it is, if the cell is just perpetually being a cell, happy being a cell, and a single cell, and this is the G0 phase. The actual process of mitosis, again, this little sliver in that big pie chart, that's the animated shift here of it. We talked about these. Again, the biggest thing I want you to come away with here is make sure you know what's happening with the chromosomes at the different phases here. All right? That's kind of the important thing. So, because it's really, again, if we don't get the DNA properly copied and make sure each new cell has its own exact copy of the DNA, then it can't produce everything else it needs anyway. Right, so that's, that's, that's the reason I'm, I'm placing emphasis on that. Again, we're gonna go through a prophase where we get just basically kind of get organized. We begin breaking down uh, in prophase, we begin breaking down the nuclear envelope, holding the chromosomes nice and orderly. And then once uh, and these the mitotic spindles begin to mature, they begin to form during prometaphase and, and metaphase. The spindles will move to opposite ends of the cell. They'll grow these microtubules and attach to those chromosomes. Anaphase is where we'll actually separate them. So we'll pull one copy of one chromatid to each end, and once they separate, then now they become chromosomes. The telophase is where everything else moves to opposite ends of this new larger cell, where I basically got two copies of the cell on each end. And then cytokinesis, where some protein ring or other structure comes in and physically shrinks in, separates the, the uh, plasma membrane off into two. Questions here? I'll be honest with you, this is kind of the central point of the, the test two material. All the signals, communication is, is leading, telling the cell, hey, you need to start this process. Um, this is kind of the, the culmination, it's the climax, if you will, of the story of, of the mitosis process is, is getting the DNA in the right place um, and then having the cell ready to where it's just to yourselves. 
Uh, if we understand this, then it makes understanding what's going on in meiosis a lot more straightforward. There's, there's some additional ch uh, information there going on in meiosis, but very, very similar process occurring in meiosis. So if we, if we understand how this works, it makes, it makes everything else kind of worthwhile and, and a little bit easier. Questions here? problem if there are. Let's get them out. All right, well, email me if things aren't aren't clear. All right, so in chapter 10, there's this section. We take a little time. We talk about, okay, well, how do we, how does the cell know it's doing the right thing? How does the cell know that it's, uh, it's okay to move from one phase to the next? And how do we control the mitosis process? Well, there's signals. There's internal signals they can send to each other. Autocrine signals, if you will. Uh, there are three major checkpoints, right? and, and I've kind of, in, in simplest terms, um, the, the G1 checkpoint is, is basically saying, hey, do you have all the proteins, all the energy, everything you need? That's the G1 checkpoint. Right? Now, the, <clears throat> so the G2 checkpoint is this guy over here. Is there any DNA damage? Right. If the DNA is damaged, because the DNA gets duplicated in the S phase, all the DNA gets, all the chromosomes get duplicated in the S phase. If any irregularities or changes or damage is detected, then we need to fix those. Right. So there's this checkpoint towards the end of the G2 phase where um, some molecules can come in and take over and, and stop the process from proceeding. We don't want to divide cell with a bad copy of DNA because then we generate more bad copies with more bad copies of DNA so we want to check at this point is there DNA damage and then again you've got this the mitotic spindle is the structure that grabs onto the, the chromatids inside those chromosome pairs and separates them we need to make sure that each does each side of the cell, does each spindle have one chromatid each, with each of the pairs? All are you going to have the same number of chromosomes after we pull these apart and split them uh, that we started with? Okay, so that's the last checkpoint. Is this basically the mitotic checkpoint in the uh, uh, in between, <clears throat> right as it's ready to pull those those chromosomes apart? Okay. Back to black ink here, in case I want to draw something else. There we go. So how does that regulation occur? Well, for regulate, how is this process regulated? We mentioned there's two main, I call them flavors, there's two types of regulation. We have what we call positive regulation. That is where some signal, ligand if you will, it's transmitted throughout the cell and says, "Hey, we're, we are we're good to go. We're ready to proceed. Move on to the next. Move on to the next level. You hit the save point. Those of you who played games, you hit the save point. You made your own save point. Um, negative regulation. If that's positive regulation, is to move on. The negative regulation is probably pretty self-explanatory. That's something that causes the cycle to halt. We didn't. We hit the checkpoint. We didn't complete all." All the, the checklist, we need to fix something else. We talked about a couple of uh, molecules, um, the RBP53 and the RBP21. That is their job to, if they detect damage in the DNA, it's their job to stop the process and recruit, your text says, recruit enzymes necessary to, to repair the DNA. Uh, we mentioned that those are tumor suppressor molecules because their their job is to not let uh, a, a a daughter cell be produced that has damage in its DNA because that damage in the DNA then uh, can cause other damages or allow other damages to be propagated. <clears throat> you know, there's, uh, one thing we'll talk about is there's always mutations occurring within DNA and, and a lot of a lot of it will get caught, sometimes fixed, 
but over time, those, those mutations can add up. Um, and we talked about cancer, and we talked about you know some causes of cancer. And a lot of times, a lot of causes of cancer are um, damage done to the DNA that codes for these two proteins, RB p53 and RB p21. If if the the DNA that that creates or it codes for the information for creation of those two proteins, if it's damaged, then the cell is is has less ability. That newly produced cell has less ability to actually regulate its own DNA damage control. And so now it's more likely that those daughter cells, the damage RB, P53 and RB21, um, it's more likely that they'll allow even more damaged DNA to propagate in their granddaughter cells, in their great granddaughter cells, if you will. Okay. So, again, two types of regulation. Can we move forward? Or, hey, there's a problem, we need to fix it before we move forward. Okay. And that brings us then into chapter 11. I just grabbed all the terms. Remember chapter 11, when we first introduced this, we said here's a whole bunch of terms. Make sure you're familiar with these. What are their differences? What are their similarities? Okay. Um, asexual reproduction, where we're you know, basically you're, you're talking about single cell organisms going through mitosis, basically, where they're producing exact copies of each other. They're cloning. Uh, whereas sexual reproduction, that is the process that, uh, again, is, is common. Almost all organisms that go through sexual reproduction, the process of mitosis is almost always the same. Okay, so it's something that evolved very early in, in life here on, on our planet and has propagated through evolution through almost all eukaryotic organisms. Um, <coughs> sorry. We talked about uh, gametes, haploid cells, what that means. Again, if you don't have a firm grasp on these, just make a note. Make sure you got a good firm grasp before you take the exam. Somatic cells, diploid cells, what the zygote is. And then meiosis, which is going to be kind of the, that's the whole point then of, of chapter 11. This is talking about meiosis. Versus mitosis. Again, mitosis, the goal of mitosis is to produce identical daughters, exact replicas where the, the parent cell, the first cell, before it goes through S phase and, and everything else, um, you, after mitosis, the goal is to create an exact copy of that cell. And okay. so in human cells, um, before the process of mitosis, again, 23 pairs of chromosomes, that's 46 chromosomes total. After S phase, those 46 chromosomes have been copied, that's 92 chromatids, 46 Xs with 92 total eggs, okay? Except for the Y chromosome, that's another story, right? Um, <clears throat> after mitosis has occurred, now I've got two daughter cells that have got 46 individual chromosomes. 23 pairs. As opposed to meiosis, the goal of meiosis is to produce haploid cells, to reduce the number of chromosomes of the regular diploid cells by half. So before meiosis, the parent cell starts out with 46, and in humans, starts out with 46 chromosomes, right? We duplicate all 46 of those, that generates 92 chromatids. And all 92 of those get divided up four ways. 92 divided by four makes 23. So then I generate four different cells after the two meiosis rounds. I generate four different cells, each with 23 chromosomes. <clears throat> and again, meiosis goes through two rounds. Similar mechanisms to what we saw in mitosis. In fact, we give most of the processes the same name. Okay. So you're still going to go through an S phase one, a G phase one, an S phase one, and a G phase two. And during S phase one, all of the chromosomes get duplicated. So again, now I've got 46 chromosomes. They've all been duplicated. That makes 92 chromatids. During prophase one, Again, we, we mentioned, let's see what have I got here. Yeah, okay. 
We mentioned um, that these the, the pairs, the homologous chromosomes, where you've got one from the father and one from the mother, in meiosis, in meiosis one, those chromosomes actually will fuse together. They'll join, they'll fuse, but they'll be connected together and held together. They'll sort out to where they're actually held together. During mitosis, the homologous chromosomes, they can be anywhere. They, they don't have to be joined, but in, in the meiosis process, they have to be joined together for some a very specific purpose we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, and then for metaphase and for anaphase, um, for anaphase one, because the goal here is to reduce the number of chromosomes by half, you have 46 chromosomes. They're, they're paired replicated chromosomes, but they're still chromosomes. 23 of them, half of them, go to one side of the cell and the other half goes to the other side of the cell. And it's random as to whether, you know, um, it's not going to be all of the paternal, all the father chromosomes are going to go to one side and all the mother chromosomes are going to go to the other side. It's, it's random how they get shuffled. So each, each cell will end up with some father chromosomes and some mother chromosomes. And those two will get, those two cells will get split. <clears throat> And then now I've got these a smaller number of chromosomes, but they're still in this X shape. They're still duplicated with two chromatids in each chromosome. Meiosis II is where those chromatids get pulled apart into individual chromosomes. Now, so again, here's, if you look back here in meiosis one, you've got one cell going to two. We go to meiosis two, now I've got two identical cells in meiosis two that are going to get split up again. And they're not identical, by the way. I shouldn't say that. They're not identical. But yeah, I do have two cells that resulted from meiosis one. Those two cells are then going to get split again down to four cells. So <clears throat> again, from this parent cell, I end up with four haploid gametes as a result of meiosis one, meiosis one and meiosis too. Now, a lot of effort to go through for, for sexual reproduction. Why and why? Well, sexual reproduction provides organisms with an opportunity to uh, really increase the diversity within their genetic pool. There's two main mechanisms. We spend a lot of time talking about this in, in class. There's two main mechanisms that, that really contribute to providing good genetic diversity. Why is that important? Well, again, it gives organisms an opportunity to find which genetic combinations give them this, any particular genetic combination, give them an advantage. And is there, um, <clears throat> essentially Darwin observed that um, particular beak shapes, for example, would give birds an advantage over a particular food source that was readily available. And so by allowing the organisms to mix and match their genetic codes, it allowed different beak shapes to emerge and different beak shapes were better at getting a particular food than other beak shapes. Right? So different organisms, different you know, diversity was allowed to evolve where this particular group could get at this food source that's readily available and this particular group could get at another food source that's readily available. Meiosis allows or contributes to the possibility of that diversity and allowing organisms to, to thrive or evolve in a particular direction. How does it do that? Well, there's two shuffling events, essentially. And there's two things that allow shuffling. Again, we talked about in meiosis one, the homologous chromatids from the mother and the father cells will be held together very closely. This doesn't occur in mitosis, it only occurs in meiosis one. So all the, the number one chromosomes, one chromosome from the father, one chromosome from the mother, they're held together with these protein structures and they're allowed to swap information. So they're allowed to just kind of randomly, and they're just showing one crossover here. And if you remember these chromosomes are pretty long in terms of drawing not to scale. There's a lot of information a lot of times on one chromosome. There's often a lot of different places that this crossover can occur. And so it's not uncommon that they'll, they'll twist up in multiple places. It won't just be at the very tips there. 
that they'll exchange information. They exchange information at any point along those chromosomes. And so what happens then, right, again, they're, they're showing you here, blue probably representing like from the, the, the father cells and the red representing the chromosomes contributed from the mother cells. And what they're saying is, so part of the father cell will merge on the mother cell and part of the mother cell will merge on the father chromosome, I should say. And so now I've got four unique chromatids to be separated out later into four unique gametes, just from one single crossover event. And again, multiple crossover events will occur on each chromosome, not just one. So I've got 23 different pairs of chromosomes, 23 different chromosomes swapping information, lots and lots of possible combinations. And again, in addition to that, during anaphase one, during meiosis one, there's a random separation. So the, the, some of the mother chromosomes will go to the top cell, some of the mother chromosomes go to the bottom cell. Some of the father chromosomes go to the top cell. Some of the father chromosomes will go to the bottom cell. In addition to the crossover, so you shuffle the information between the chromosomes, and then you shuffle which chromosomes go to which gamete. And all of them get done independently. It's, it's like, it, it's, I guess maybe it's like um, taking a deck of cards and shuffling the deck of cards. But in addition to shuffling the deck of cards, the cards will actually swap their symbols internally. So the two of spades might uh, send one of its spades to the three of diamonds, and the three of diamonds might send back a diamond to the two of spades. So in addition to shuffling, the symbols on the cards are also swapping. So think about that. That's, that's how we get so much genetic diversity, is by those, again, these two events, crossover between the like chromosomes, and then it's, they're shuffled as to which way they get separated out the gametes. Again, this produces four unique gametes that have chromosomes that are not found in either the father or the mother, but parts of each. Okay. Questions, comments, complaints, guys? Go forth and study and sharpen your knowledge of chapters 9, 10, 11. <laughs> What's a uh, test next Monday? Yeah, they take the weekend to study. We'll start chapter 12, which goes right along with what we're talking about. Not on the exam, but yeah, we'll start chapter 12 on, on Wednesday. And then we'll do lab Wednesday evening. Okay. All right, guys. Have a good rest of your week.